제4차 산업혁명, 이젠 우리에게 익숙한 말이 됐습니다. 하지만 정보통신기술의 빠른 발달은 우리를 익숙하지 않은 세계로 이끌어가고 있습니다. 3D 프린팅과 인공지능, 로봇 등으로 상징되는 제4차 산업혁명은 전 세계에 어떤 변화를 가져올까요? 그리고 우리는 이런 변화에 어떻게 대응할까요? 오늘도 리더는 세계경제연구원의 초청으로 방한하는 월터 쇼렌스타인 아시아 퍼스픽 인서치 센터의 겐지 쿠시다 연구위원을 모시고 이에 대한 답을 모색해보는 시간을 가져보겠습니다. 땡큐 so much for your taking time of your busy schedule to join us today. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Mm -hmm. So you are invited to the international conference of IGE at, uh, today, and you've been working for Walter Schoenstein as a Prospect Research Center, as a research associate. So would you introduce the center and, the, and the what is your research area? Sure. Uh, the Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University uh, covers many areas of Asia geographically and many disciplines. We have economists, political scientists, I do political economy, former diplomats, and various people do various projects. My current focus is on IT innovation in Silicon Valley. And I'm running a project called the Stanford Silicon Valley New Japan Project, which is looking at uh, how Silicon Valley can be harnessed and how, in this case, Japan can be brought to Silicon Valley, but at the same time looking at what the uh, cutting edge changes are because Silicon Valley is disrupting industries all over the world. So the topic of the international conference is the post-industrial revolution, the future of Korean economy. So what is your topic and can you briefly summarize your presentation? Yes, basically the fourth industrial revolution, the way I see it, at the core of the change drivers is something called the algorithmic revolution. People's activities when they're captured by software algorithms can become split apart, recombined, and all of this the, all of these things like AI, artificial intelligence, fintech, robotics, and other things we don't know about yet, big data, other things, these are all coming out of this fundamental transformation of mm -hmm. transforming human activities with algorithms mm -hmm. into something where it's originally only humans can do the activity. Then it becomes hybrid, where it's machine assisted. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes fully automated. Mm -hmm. And all human activities are moving towards becoming automated. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the main argument here mm -hmm. is that things like AI mm -hmm. uh, are automating activities that used to be mm -hmm. only done by humans, like mm -hmm. driving a car. Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed for 100 years how long it takes. Mm -hmm. Then with something like Uber, the platform, mm -hmm. it becomes more productive, a little more hybrid, because it's more efficient for what people do, mm -hmm. which is driving more efficient allocation of that. But then we're now moving towards fully automated. Mm -hmm. So this activity of driving mm -hmm. has now become fully automated. Mm -hmm. Same in finance. Mm -hmm. Stock pickers used to be people. Mm -hmm. And then in individual wealth management people used to be people. Uh, and then yeah. software, mm -hmm. then hybrid people using software. And now fully automated robo-advisors. Robo yeah. Mm -hmm. So all of these areas, human activity is moving towards being captured by algorithms mm -hmm that's then moving towards automation. Mm -hmm. So the imagination is the upper bound, mm -hmm. not constraints on computing resources. Because mm -hmm. now computing resources have gone from, it used to be scarce resources, mm -hmm. but now computing resources are abundant. Mm -hmm. So we have a new abundance of computing resources that we can use to automate human activity. Mm -hmm. And that's appearing in all sorts of places. And that's what's driving the fourth uh, industrial revolution. So you just uh, talked about the, the, the post, talked about the post industrial revolution a lot and actually it's now taking place in at a very uh, rapid speed yeah but can you define the uh, I mean the uh, can you tell us the, the exact definition what is the post industrial revolution definition so the term fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. was coined by uh, the founder, uh, Dr. Klaus, of, Professor Klaus of the uh, World Economic Forum uh, in his book. Mm -hmm. um, 
not everybody agrees with the exact definition. Mm -hmm. So the way I like to think about it mm -hmm. is it's more simply there are several types of industrial change, industrial technologies, and algorithms that can transform activities in a large number of ways very soon. Mm -hmm. And so my definition would be introduces new technological trajectories, reorganizes global industries, mm -hmm. and transforms production processes. Mm -hmm. And all the other three industrial revolutions historically have done these things. Mm -hmm. And we're on the cusp of another one. Mm -hmm. So in terms of technological trajectories, mm -hmm. things like automobiles. Mm -hmm. What's the technological trajectory of an automobile development? Mm -hmm. It went from regular automobiles to maybe hybrid engines, mm -hmm. maybe hydrogen next, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden automated driving. Mm -hmm. And so the automated driverless one, that's a new technological trajectory shift that's coming out of Silicon Valley. It's coming out of Google, uh, Tesla, mm -hmm. and these places. Everybody else has to adjust to it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. So I wonder what the differences are between the first industrial revolution and the previous ones. So the amount of processing power that can be used for uh, augmenting and automating human activity can be applied to people's actions in all sorts of services areas. Mm -hmm. The previous ones were more about mechanical mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. that then takes human effort and makes it through mechanical power into automation. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's software mm -hmm. that can then uh, augment people's brain power and vast amounts of information that can be processed. Mm -hmm. IoT, Internet of Things, mm -hmm. is one of the buzzwords now. What's underneath that is cheap sensors that can be brought, mm -hmm. that can put, be put anywhere. Measuring things is much cheaper than ever before. Mm -hmm. It can be inside factories. It can be on an airplane to see how your vital signs are if you ride in uh, mm -hmm. Asiana versus, uh, say, uh, United Airlines, mm -hmm. much better in Asiana, mm -hmm. right? But you can measure these things. How do you measure it? Mm -hmm. If you have insurance mm -hmm. for uh, car insurance, how do you measure whether you're a good driver or not a good driver? Mm -hmm. Well, for insurance, that's what's important. Mm -hmm. But the best way you can measure it now is maybe how old you are, where you live, what your education mm -hmm. level is, what kind of car you drive, do you have previous tickets? Mm -hmm. Well, now you can just put sensors in cars. Mm -hmm. We have a smartphone yeah. so that has the data to it. Mm -hmm. So you can measure if it's a good driver or a bad driver. Mm -hmm. And bad drivers usually think they are good drivers. Mm -hmm. So if you have an insurance policy that then has bad drivers whose price goes up, yeah. good driver price goes down, mm -hmm. but then the bad driver sees his price go up, so you drive better. Mm -hmm. You want to lower your price. Mm -hmm. Well, we can do this now. Mm -hmm. It's not very difficult. Mm -hmm. And it can be all automated. Mm -hmm. This is a revolution in the, uh, this is one type of fintech mm -hmm. uh, innovation. Yeah. And so in this industrial revolution, this is the kind of new business model, new activity that wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. And it's encapsulated in the, uh, mm -hmm. this broad conception of the fourth change. Mm -hmm. And all of this was not possible without mm -hmm. massive computing resources that's commonly called cloud computing. Mm -hmm. uh, cloud seems like it's sort of up in the air. Mm -hmm. But actually, we're talking about big one billion dollar or more data centers mm -hmm. uh, that are all over the world owned and built by companies like Google, Microsoft, mm -hmm. Amazon, Amazon yeah. who then have made computing abundance now a resource that's abundant. Mm -hmm. So computing resources are no longer the constraint for doing this. Mm -hmm. the, the world's fastest supercomputer in 1985 mm -hmm. was called the Cray-2. There are only a few of them in the world. Mm -hmm. That's about the same speed mm -hmm. processor as one-sixth of the iPhone 6 mm -hmm. that was introduced mm -hmm. two years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there are lots and lots of smartphones out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this kind of processing power abundance mm -hmm. is what we're now riding on. And that's driving the Industrial Revolution, the fourth Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you agree with this or not, but uh, uh, recent technological, technological innovation is said not to boost the productivity uh, as much as the previous industrial revolution 
Do you agree with this? Or, and do you believe the fourth industrial revolution uh, could make uh, the notable growth of productivity in the industrial, industrial field? Well, this is a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the favorite examples lately in Korea, I think, is AlphaGo, uh, <laughs> where uh, the five matches here in Seoul. Yeah, AlphaGo surprised Korean people a lot. <laughs> yeah, Lee Sedo uh, put up a good fight. Mm -hmm. But AlphaGo was run on top of DeepMind, mm -hmm. Google's AI engine called DeepMind, that mm -hmm. they bought from the England, yeah. from the UK in 2014 for over $500 million. Mm -hmm. So DeepMind is an AI engine, mm -hmm. pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. DeepMind is now available only inside Google, mm -hmm. for Google. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how much processing power it used, mm -hmm. but AI right now for lots of pattern recognition needs a lot of processing power. Mm -hmm. Processing power is getting cheaper and cheaper. Mm -hmm. It's going exponential. Mm -hmm. It's still going exponential following something similar to Moore's Law, mm -hmm. double every two years. Mm -hmm. So Google's most advanced data center now is only half of what it is two years from now. Mm -hmm. It's already double what humanity has accomplished two years ago. Mm -hmm. It keeps doubling. Mm -hmm. So the it's question is, yeah. yes, so the question is, deep mind, mm -hmm. when is it going to be available to everybody mm -hmm. for a subscription? Mm -hmm. Maybe $50 a month, mm -hmm. maybe $20 a month. Mm -hmm. If you could use deep mind for anything, mm -hmm. what would you use it for? Mm -hmm. Google in, uh, July of this year, mm -hmm. used DeepMind to optimize its data center mm -hmm. cooling system. Mm -hmm. uh, Google data centers use so much energy because they're so big. Mm -hmm. They consume overall 0.01% of the world's electricity. Mm -hmm. Lots of electricity. Mm -hmm. It was very optimized, very costly, mm -hmm. very highly paid Google engineers optimizing it. Mm -hmm. They had DeepMind optimize and say, okay, let's try ha having DeepMind optimize the cooling system. They got 40% efficiency gain mm -hmm. and 15% reduction in their utility mm -hmm. cost for electricity. Mm -hmm. This is something that was already well optimized. Mm -hmm. So the real impact on productivity mm -hmm. of the fourth industrial revolution mm -hmm. will be when things like DeepMind mm -hmm. are offered to all of us mm -hmm. very cheaply to do anything we want with them. Mm -hmm. I asked my Google friend, is this going to come, is this uh, going to happen soon? And he said, yeah, we're preparing it right now. Oh. So, no matter who you are, what company you work for, no matter what you do, my deep mind question that I ask people mm -hmm. is, well, if you have deep mind available tomorrow, what would you do with it? So, what will happen if all of us could use the deep mind in our daily life? Well, first, starting with companies, mm -hmm. Everything logistics you can optimize better, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're an airline, you're a factory, or mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. uh, anything you'd like to do pattern recognition for, mm -hmm. you could use something like mm -hmm. DeepMind for. Mm -hmm. So productivity can go mm -hmm. very, very mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, do you need enough people? Does that displace a lot of people? Mm -hmm. right? Usually the question mm -hmm. when you have technology mm -hmm. yeah. that makes people very Drops. productive mm -hmm. is you need fewer people. Mm -hmm. So. So then the question is, does AI only replace people, or can it also augment people? Mm -hmm. The usual debate about AI is that the high-skilled people mm -hmm. will be okay. If you're a creative yeah, worker, but, or but uh, the problem is low skilled. But low skilled, yeah. you become a commodity. Mm -hmm. But that's not fully correct, I think. Oh. So there's a Japanese company called Komatsu that yeah. Komatsu that does uh, uh, construction equipment diggers, bulldozers, mining trucks, mm -hmm. uh, things like this. Uh, Komatsu has a new system where they can get somebody who used to, uh, who has not had much experience mm -hmm. using one of these diggers mm -hmm. to do very difficult work that previously could only be done if you have 10 years of experience. Mm -hmm. So. A full AI that's fully automated has to figure out everything. Mm -hmm. But even if you're not an experienced operator, you can pick, if you can figure out if this thing here, is that a big rock or is it a plastic bag? Mm -hmm. No problem. Mm -hmm. But you move the device to where it needs to do something sophisticated, mm -hmm. and then you autopilot. Mm -hmm. So digging using a circular motion, a slope, it's very difficult. You have to do it just right. If you dig too much, mm -hmm. then you have to recalculate and recut it lot of uh, cost. Mm -hmm. But their system which uses sensors and drone-based data mm -hmm. and 
uh, intelligence augmentation mm -hmm. type of AI. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is AI. Intelligence augmentation is mm -hmm. IA. Mm -hmm. Using that, they can I get yeah. less skilled people to do highly skilled jobs. Mm -hmm. oh. And this means a great so deal. In interesting, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm. So then the question mm. becomes not who is going to be replaced only, but also what kind of low-end jobs mm. can become mm. high-skilled work. Mm -hmm. And uh, this opens up policy implications if you're unions, mm. if you're in shipbuilding or something and you're worried about the shipbuilding. Mm. It's a big issue here in Korea, right? Mm. But then yeah. who, what kind of work can these people do? Well, let's figure out what kind of work can be done mm -hmm. with low-skilled people for one particular job mm -hmm. into high-skilled. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that DeepMind will be very useful for. Mm -hmm. oh, so this is where we're going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But still, many people are worrying about the kind of the potential job replacement by the robot or the artificial intelligence. And uh, you, maybe you remember the prediction uh, that was made in uh, Davos Forum last January. And according to the prediction, 7.1 million jobs will be replaced, will disappear right. by 2020 in advanced countries. So what do you think about this opinion? So that's looking at the classic way of here are the jobs mm. that currently exist, and here is what AI mm. can replace yeah. and make redundant. Mm. It doesn't include the part about how if you, if you are uh, low-skilled, what new jobs can you move low-skilled to high-skilled? What new jobs are created? Because you can't know these things. Mm. In the United States and in Japan, in the 1960s, an office mm. looked like this. If we want to communicate and make a phone call, uh, you pick up your phone, which then connects to an operator in your building, who then connects to the uh, telephone operator for long distance, who then connects to another person at the other end, who connects to another uh, four people at least mm -hmm. to make a phone call. If you're going to make a graph, uh, somebody has to go run around to the library to get data. Another person takes a paper spreadsheet, writes the numbers on it, uses a calculator to calculate it, mm. gives it to another person who uses a protractor and compass to draw yeah, a graph. Yeah. Uh, who then uh, gives it to somebody who types, and all they do is type. Yeah. And then when we talk, uh, a transcript, or if, if you're, there's a secretary who writes our letters that we write by hand or say to yeah. them, we want three copies, they do it three times. Mm -hmm. Each white-collar worker had a very large number of support staff mm -hmm. to, do with, to do the function of what we do very easily now, mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. Where did all these people go? Are they all homeless on the street? No. Mm -hmm. Did some people have to take lower paying jobs? Mm -hmm. Yes, probably. Mm -hmm. Did everybody have to? No. Mm -hmm. So if this paradigm is brought to the question of AI, mm -hmm. of course there are current jobs that will disappear. Mm -hmm. But we don't know if there are more jobs that will appear, New jobs. especially if low skilled workers can do high mm -hmm. skill jobs. We simply don't know. Maybe they are less. In which case, even so, that the, that uh, seven million jobs figure is not mm -hmm. accurate. You can't say that because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. There might be many more mm -hmm. that disappear, mm -hmm. because high skill jobs mm -hmm. may be replaced by low skill people. Mm -hmm. If you're a doctor mm -hmm. and you read X-rays or CT scans, mm -hmm. the IBM Watson AI engine yeah. has already proved mm -hmm. that it can do a better job. Mm -hmm. So then you don't need the doctor to do that. The doctor might do other things that are higher end. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need fewer kinds of this particular kind of doctor. Mm -hmm. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Mm -hmm. The output is, if the output is better diagnoses for more people, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And we'll worry about the doctors later. Mm -hmm. So it's misleading, I think. It may be true, but it's misleading. Oh. And the unfortunate truth is we cannot predict. Mm -hmm. Maybe there will be lots of jobs. Mm -hmm. Maybe there will be very few jobs. Mm -hmm. But we really don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. <laughs> so you are from the Stanford University near Silicon Valley. So uh, what do you think the, are the strengths of the Silicon Valley area for uh, stimulating innovation? So there are several things that help Silicon Valley work. And each of the pieces work together. So just one or, the, one or another piece by itself doesn't really help. Mm -hmm. 
The big pieces include venture capital mm -hmm. of the kind that requires firms to grow very quickly. Mm -hmm. A venture capital firm, the top type of venture capital firm, if they have a portfolio of 100 companies, mm -hmm. maybe one or two companies produce the entire performance of 100 companies. Mm -hmm. Everything else is uh, made to go bankrupt or sold to big companies. Mm -hmm. So they need very, very fast growth companies, one or two superstars mm -hmm. in each portfolio of 10 years, mm -hmm. maybe 100 firms. Mm -hmm. So then what delivers this high growth? It's the firms that automate human activity the most, because that's what scales. That's back to our algorithmic revolution. Mm -hmm. So there's intense financial pressure to make companies that grow very fast mm -hmm. to become that one or two fast growth companies in the venture capital's portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's venture capital. And then human resources. They get the best and brightest from around the world. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk. Like you. <laughs> <laughs> but Elon Musk, mm -hmm. who made Tesla and mm -hmm. SpaceX, mm -hmm. he's a back, he came to North America from South Africa mm -hmm. with just a backpack on his back, mm -hmm. went to Canada, uh, eventually made his way to the US, but he was a nobody. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a wealthy son of somebody, mm -hmm. but he made it. Mm -hmm. And so now he's in the middle of Silicon Valley, yeah. starting from a complete outsider. There are very few places in the world where you can be that much of an outsider. Mm -hmm. And first he made one company, sold it, reinvested and made what became PayPal, mm -hmm. sold that, mm -hmm. and then became uh, started his own vi SpaceX and Tesla. Yeah, he's a great guy. <laughs> and so, yeah, <laughs> so everybody's coming from somewhere else mm -hmm. and there's a mechanism for them to grow. Mm -hmm. And often they use universities too. Mm -hmm. People go from universities to industry, mm -hmm. but then back again to universities. Mm -hmm. For example, Uber just purchased uh, a couple, re several core researchers and a lot of research staff and postdocs from Carnegie Mellon's robotics lab, mm -hmm. about 40 people all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically you have a university department that got mostly bought out by a private mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. So then there was a media interview with the computer science department chair at Carnegie Mellon mm -hmm. saying, are, are you upset that your computer science department just mm -hmm. got bought out? Mm -hmm. And he said, no problem. I was actually at Google until five years ago. Mm -hmm. So. It's fine if these people who went to industry and then have theoretical breakthroughs. Yeah, circulation. And then they can go back to university. Mm -hmm. Circulation, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So circulation between universities and private industry, mm -hmm. circulation from all over the world that comes to Silicon Valley, and they can go back somewhere. And it creates brain circulation mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so these are, these are the core drivers. Mm -hmm. There are several others too, but yeah. yeah. Uh, time is almost done, so uh, this is my last question. So, in the era of the post-industrial revolution, what should people do to survive, <laughs> not to fall behind uh, yeah. in, in the competition? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, if we all had the answer to that, life would be easy. However, what not to do, probably, mm -hmm. is to see all of this change coming and try to guard against it. And any th anybody that uh, tries to uh, guard against a big wave that comes, you get washed away. Mm -hmm. It's better to ride the wave, yeah. to surf it. Mm -hmm. uh, a nice Korean previous example, the smartphone revolution. Mm -hmm. Nokia was world leader, uh, Motorola was second, and then we went from regular cell phones to smartphones. Mm -hmm they were not able to ride the wave. Samsung was able to ride the wave. And so, uh, until very recent problems too, they were just fine, they rode the wave. Mm -hmm. So, things like sharing economy, mm -hmm. uh, something like Uber Ooh. type thing. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a taxi, and this happens around the world too, if you're a taxi industry, mm -hmm. do you think the right response is to try to guard against it or instead embrace it and ride it? Mm -hmm. Say, okay, there's Uber, but we are a higher quality Uber that does, uh, that provides higher quality, if your quality is higher. Mm -hmm. And maybe mix it with uh, objective measures, uh, say eyeglasses that have a little sensor in there mm -hmm. that can measure how much you're concentrating, mm -hmm. or if you're sleepy, it tells you before you're sleepy, these are already out there. Mm -hmm. If you make a new platform that's mm -hmm. Uber plus that, mm -hmm. if people are worried about using Uber for quality, mm -hmm. then you can have an objective measure too. If you're an insurer, 
maybe you make an insurance product mm -hmm. that then does somebody who wants to lend to their young neighbors mm -hmm. their car that they're not using on uh, non-peak times. Mm -hmm. So do you ride the wave or do you try to uh, mm -hmm. block it? And then we'd be creative about how to ride the wave. If you're Airbnb, uh, maybe there's a service of helping other people prepare their Airbnb in between. It can be an ancillary one. And so those are very simple, low-level examples. Mm -hmm. But we're starting to see what's going to come. Mm -hmm. So we need to ride it. Yeah. So good lesson. Don't guard against the change. Just ride on it. Yeah, okay? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So thank you so much giving us the, the thank you so much for giving us the valuable insight uh, about the, the first industrial revolution. So I hope you have a good trip back to the U.S. Thank, thank you so you much. much.